indicators of potential U.S. status, of which if even just one applies, then the account will be treated as a U.S. account, unless the account holder can provide evidence to the contrary. And Nolan and I will now outline these indicators with the benefit of a few examples. Well, first up, meet Ronaldo. He works in Singapore and lives there much of the time. He trades very actively on the global markets using investment accounts in Tokyo and London. He presented a U.S. passport when opening these accounts and gave his U.S. residential address rather than his address in Singapore. Documentary evidence of U.S. residency or citizenship for example, Ronaldo's passport and a U.S. address linked to an account are both very strong indicators of U.S. status. So, Ronaldo's accounts, if they have an average balance of more than $50,000, must be treated as U.S. accounts in accordance with FATCA rules. Ronaldo's case is pretty straightforward, but let's have a look now at Natalie. She's French and has a French passport to prove it. She lives and works in Paris with her husband, Robert, who has a Swiss passport. Natalie and Robert hold a joint account in Paris. At account opening, they presented their passports and gave their Paris residential address. This information is all held on record by the account holding institution, together with other details, including Robert's place of birth, which is given as Boston, Massachusetts. Natalie's and Robert's passports confirm that they are not US citizens nor do they live in the U.S., nor is there a U.S. address linked to their account. However, Robert was born in the U.S., and for FATCA purposes, this marks him out potentially as a person with U.S. status. In theory, this means that the accounts he shares with Natalie could be treated as U.S. accounts for FATCA, unless they prove otherwise. Now, in practice, Robert, Natalie and the institutions they bank with would have plenty of evidence in the form of passports and other records to demonstrate that the U.S. connection is neither relevant nor current and to therefore be able to confirm their accounts as being other than U.S. accounts for FATCA purposes. But they need to collect that evidence and be ready to provide it. Right. Next up, we have Reginald. Hey, Reg. Reginald is British-born and lives full-time in London. He has a number of accounts in the Cayman Islands, but has little to do with their day-to-day -day management and did not give his London address when setting them up. Reg's Cayman accounts are in fact managed via his authorized intermediary, an attorney based in Miami. From his Miami offices, Reg's attorney issues regular monthly instructions for transfers to and from Reg's Cayman accounts. Reg is British through and through. However, his authorized intermediary is based in the U.S. His Cayman accounts are managed via instructions that have been issued in the U.S. And furthermore, only a P.O. box address has been recorded with the account opening information for his Cayman accounts. Under FATCA rules, these last three points are all indicators that Reginald's Cayman accounts might need to be treated as U.S. accounts for FATCA purposes. The Cayman institutions holding Reginald's accounts may therefore need to request documents in addition to the ones they already have as evidence to verify or disprove that his accounts should be treated as U.S. accounts for FATCA purposes. And remember, if a client fails to cooperate, for example, by failing to provide requested evidence or other assistance to FFIs who are trying to establish or disprove the U.S. status of their account, then their accounts must be treated as recalcitrant accounts with all the attendant withholding tax and financial penalty implications which that entails. Let's move on now and look at accounts held by so-called artificial persons or entities, such as corporations and trusts. Which of your existing relationships with entities such as companies, trusts and financial institutions are likely to be affected by FATCA? Let's look at some examples. We'll start with Alma Industries. It has significant operations in the U.S. as well as in a number of other countries and is, in fact, already documented as a U.S. taxpayer for purposes other than FATCA. So Alma Industries accounts are presumed to be U.S. accounts for FATCA tax purposes as well. Very straightforward. Let's look now at the Borison Trust. Unlike Alma Industries, the Borison Trust isn't a U.S. taxpayer. However, the trust was incorporated in the U.S., which means that it is presumed to be a U.S. entity and its accounts are presumed to be U.S. accounts for FATCA purposes. Next up, what about Chalonex Limited? 
Chalinex isn't a U.S. taxpayer and wasn't incorporated in the U.S. However, it is part owned by Alma Industries, which has a 15% holding. Since Chalinex is more than 10% owned by a U.S. entity, then its accounts are presumed to be U.S. accounts for FATCA purposes and must be treated and reported accordingly. Any entity that is neither a U.S. taxpayer nor a U.S. incorporated nor more than 10% U.S. owned is, for FATCA purposes,